before the carols and the candles, before the trees, before the lights, before the tables are set and the meals are made, before we open our arms to welcome a new Christmas season, let's not forget to stop and prepare, but not for the parties, and not for the presents. This year, let's stop and prepare our hearts for the real reason we celebrate. Well, welcome, welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here today. Am I on? Hey, we're so glad that you're here today. Welcome to the last Sunday of 2018. Can you believe it? We're almost at 2019. Crazy. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do for a second. All right, if you are K through fifth grader in the room, I need you to wave at me like this. Do this. Look at that. We have them in the room. So welcome to church. And I know normally you're in kids ministry, you're in Main Street, but we welcome you in here today for our family worship experience. And so we're grateful that you're in here to be a part of what we're doing today. And we are actually closing a series called Christmas Welcome Jesus. You know, just a few weeks ago, what were we doing? We were talking about saying, setting up a Christmas tree putting up lights, putting gifts underneath the tree. And, and we're talking about all the stuff around Christmas. And now we're transitioning to taking down those lights and some of us dread, dreading that, right? Uh, taking down the tree. How many of you have taken down your tree already? Look at you, man, Christmas spirit is alive in your house. I'm kidding, uh, but yeah, ours is, ours is actually still up. My wife tried to take it down yesterday. I was like, what are you doing? It's still Christmas. What are you doing? We're going to leave it up. We're going to leave it up. Um, but we, we're talking about all these things. And to be honest with you, we have all this expectation, anticipation leading up to Christmas time. We can't wait to get there. And then it happens. And then the 26th come. You know, some, you know, I think by and large, the 26th can be the saddest day of the year. Right? You had all this anticipation. Everything happened in the 26th. And it's really bad if your birthday is right after Christmas. The 27th. Happy birthday to me. Like everybody tends to forget your birthday after Christmas, right? But we have all these things. And let's be honest, it is kind of melancholy, but it's never meant to be that. Joy around Christmas was never meant to be during the Christmas season. That we should be Christmas people year round. And over the past couple weeks, we've been talking about we can easily get lost in the flash of Christmas present, what Christmas has become, and lose sight of the miracle of Christmas past that paved the way for salvation for all people through Jesus Christ. Pew Research did, did some research, and they said just three years ago, 30, or 51% of U.S. adults said that Christmas for them is more a religious holiday than a cultural one. We'd be like, okay, cool. But, but that one has slipped to 46% now say that in a, in a study that was, in research that was released on Tuesday, December 12th. And only 32% say that it bothers them even somewhat that this has happened. Now, we, it doesn't take us very long to look around and say, we've, we've slipped, we've drifted a bit from the first time that Jesus entered the world, a season that received his name, not from rap presents or eggnog or lights or trees or even Santa, but a moment in history where God showed up and gave us the greatest gift of all time, Jesus. Whenever I read the sermon title, G, uh, Christmas, welcome Jesus. To me, that sounds like an introductory statement. That sounds like, hey, Christmas, I want to introduce you to Jesus. You know, I, I feel like, I fear that over time, that's kind of how we treated Jesus, like a distant relative coming in to visit. And some of you are relieved that relatives already gone home. Like we love you relatives, but we need our space. But, but maybe the relatives showed up at your door and they knocked on your door and you open the door and you say, welcome, Johnny, welcome, Susan. I fear that we treated Jesus the same way of treating him like a distant relative instead of a permanent residence in our home. I think that's what we're getting at in the course of the series that we are, we're trying to transition to say, you know, we don't want to invite Jesus just to a dinner party. 
We want to invite him to take up permanent stance in our home. We want to invite him, no, no, no. We want to invite him to be the centerpiece of our home. So as we go through Christmas season, we end Christmas season, look towards 2019, we say, we want to be Christmas people year round, not just in this season. So today we're going to talk about something else. The birth of Jesus happened, what next? What happened after the big birthday? What, what, what happened in scripture? What, ha- what does the Bible tell us about, about his family? What happened to the child after, after that? And it would be easy for us to paint a picture that everything was smooth and simple after the birth of Christ, right? It would be easy for us to, to do that. Like Jesus didn't get pushed around in an in a upper baby stroller around this town of Bethlehem. I don't think that happened. Uh, or Jesus didn't have one of those mamaroos where they put him in there and they rock back and forth without you even touching it. I, I, I can't believe it, but Jesus didn't have a sound machine. Can you imagine life without a sound machine, parents? Like you may not use it, but a couple years ago when Kit was born, we were like, we won't be sound machine people. Then we put a sound machine in a room and you can hear it through the monitor. And now we're sound machine people. Like we can't go to sleep without this sound machine. We're like, oh, how did that happen? But, but Jesus didn't have any of that. And, and we sing that song. Silent night, holy night. I think it was a holy night, but I don't know if it was a silent night. You know, there's probably some, that's probably far from the truth because they were in a cave and who knows what kind of delivery it was that baby Jesus could have cried all night after reading the Christmas story to my daughter who's two and a half now, we read the Christmas story and she said, after reading it, she said, and Jesus cried and spit up. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I would have to imagine some of that stuff happened. And, and then we say, silent night, holy night. What is it? All is calm, right? All is calm. Was it calm? I mean, there's hang, animals hanging out everywhere and, and shepherds were knocking on the door at probably the most inconvenient of times, right? I don't know if it was calm or not. You have new parents, Mary and Joseph, who's trying to figure out how to be parents. But, but more than that, trying to figure out how to be parents to the savior of the world. I imagine it was a really a big relief whenever the shepherds showed up, actually. They knock on the door and they were like, you won't believe what happened to us. Angels showed up and they told us that your baby boy is the Messiah of the world. You think Mary and Joseph was like, I thought we were crazy. <laughs> I mean, they had to have some sort of peace and comfort in that, in that time. And then other people begin to find out about Jesus, Right. And Pastor Jeff kind of walked us through the wise men a couple of weeks ago. Based on the timeline, when the wise men showed up, Jesus would have been probably right under two years old, two years of age. And the wise men showed up from the east because they followed a star in the sky that, the sky that, that told them where the Messiah was going to be. But then they, they made a pit stop into Jerusalem. And I'm thinking, why did they make a pit stop into Jerusalem? Well, well, the only thing I can think of is that that's where the king lived. And if we're going to find a king, if we're going to find a Messiah, it would be only natural to go to the palace of where that could be. And so they walked up in this palace, these three wise, we say three, it might have been more than that. We said these wise men came and they began to talk to King Herod. It was, they found a different king. Herod had no idea. And so they began to tell Herod what was happening. And Herod was threatened. Here, let me tell you something about Herod. Historians say that Herod, called Herod the Great, would have been a cruel king. He would have been a power-hungry ruler who would destroy anybody who was out to overthrow his throne. And in fact, he thought that his family was plotting against his throne, so he had some of his family members killed. This is what kind of guy we're dealing with now. And so they're telling this king about the Messiah, and they're like, and he's like, well, my throne is being threatened So I'm going to put together a plan. So he said to the wise man, Matthew chapter 2, verse 8, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Well, of course, Herod was lying. We know that because he thought that Jesus would overthrow, overthrow his kingdom one day, overthrow his throne one day, and he had this plot. Well, God warned the wise man, this is not good. He warned them of this plot. So Herod was lying. So here we have a conflict. After the birth of Christ, it wasn't smooth. You know, 
A couple years passed. They were unsure about everything. And now they're hearing this threat on their family. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. We're going to start there. But before we get into God's word today, will you pray with me? Father, my prayer will always be that we're forever changed by your words. God, your word does not return void. Your word brings hope and joy. Your word is living and active. So God, we read your word with open ears and open minds to what you have to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 13. When they had gone, he's talking about the wise men. The wise men had left and an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Verse 14. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed there until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through a prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay. We have a guy by the name of Joseph. He was a man trying to figure out how to be a dad. And not only that, he's trying to figure out how to be a dad to the savior of the world. Could you imagine what this was like for him? Now, Joseph was a normal dude. Like, he was a simple, simple guy. He was hardworking. He was honest. He was God-fearing. He, had a, he was humble. He, he, he had a, a love for people. He had a warm heart and a warm spirit. And now he's receiving news that his family is under attack. There was a kingdom. No, there was a king waging a war against his family. Wasn't interested in worshiping Jesus. Was interested in destroying Jesus. And, and Joseph had a decision to make, whether act or ignore. Whether act or ignore or ignore. And and you and I can can easily put ourselves in his situation. What would you do? Of course you would act. You, you You would find ways to protect your family at all costs. For us, we want to protect our kids. We want to protect everything about our kids, protect their lives, jump in front of a bus if we have to, or a bullet. We would do that for our kids. And there's, we see Joseph, he's out to protect his kids. He's receiving these threats on his family. And I would guess that you've had threats on your family as well. These threats maybe look different. You know, you may not have a, a crazy king out to get your kids. But you may have other worldly threats on your family that, that maybe compromise something about your family. Threats do look different. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a power-hungry king. So the first thing we have to do, and this is the first point of the message today, is that we have to recognize worldly threats that have potential to destroy our family, have potential to destroy you and your family. So there are threats. And and Scripture says in John 10.10 that the the thief is here to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is that thief? It's the enemy. It's Satan. And he's out to destroy our families at whatever cost. And you and I can probably figure out some of those threats and some of those potential threats for us, worldly threats. And, and as I go through some of these in my mind, I think about some of the things that maybe threaten my family. I'm thinking it's busyness. One of those threats may be busyness. And, and again, some of these threats may be innocent. Maybe you might not even know that there are threats to you and your family, but long term, they may be. See, the idea whenever I think about busyness, I think about all the things I am in life, all the roles that I play in life. The American culture tell, tells us that if we are really busy, that means we're really important. You know, here's the thing. Sometimes people can intentionally create this perception of busyness to, to make people believe that um, they're valuable or productive in life. But here's the thing. Here's what busyness can become. A wall that keeps us from being vulnerable and honest. It keeps us from authentic relationships with other people. Adrian Rogers, a, a pastor, pastor I love, he passed away a few years ago. He said this. He said, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Well, what about this one? Happiness. I like to be happy. Right? But here's the thing about happiness that we have got to be careful of. Happiness is temporary. Happiness is temporary. But you know what's not? Joy. If we're always living for happiness, we will never be satisfied. But if we're living for joy, that's eternal. Or or what about this? Oh my. 
media. Did you know that on average, the American child spends over eight and a half hours on social media every day, on, on some sort of media, whether that's TV, computer, um, they're watching or, or video games or whatever it is. And, and, and we've got to be careful because, and I'm not saying media is bad, right? It, because it can be used for good, but, but it depends on what, what do we let into our home will be let out in some way, right? What about this one? Because I think this one associated with this one image that we have to have some sort of image, uphold some sort of in image in order to please other people. And, and I think this uh, largely, we could see this happening through social media, right? And, and through Instagram and Facebook, we, we're after the likes. Uh, what about this? Wandering eyes, sexual desires, you know, the number one cause of divorce in the United States is infidelity. This leads to that. Or what about this? Number two, leading cause of divorce in the United States. Money, finance, financial pressures. Just because the more money you have doesn't mean that stuff goes away. That's a threat to us. And again, these things can be good. Well, some of them. And, and, but, but if we lean on them too much, they become a bad thing. They become a threat to our families. What about this? What about fame? You know, the two out of three kids today want to be YouTubers. Did you know that? Two out, out of three, you can make good money in YouTubing, I've heard. But all of it has to be, I want to be known. I want to be famous. And, and sometimes at the expense of our faith and our family, we've got to be careful. And, and, and here's the thing, like for, for parents in the room, you can look at your kids and say, man, I want them to be famous. And you can put a lot of hard work into making them famous at the expense of your faith and your family. What about idols? Anything could be an idol when you put something above, elevated above Christ. Is it, that could be money. That could be any of these things. And now you're looking at that list and you're thinking, wow. And you may add others to this list. And I'm thinking that's worldly threats, but what are they threading? What's the threat on? Well, I think for all of us, it's our values. It, it threats our values, what we believe. And as Christ followers, what are some of those values for us? Well, for us, it's beliefs. That, that foundationally there's truths about who we are and why we are created. That we are created to worship and honor our God in heaven. What about the church? The church is God's way of demonstrating goodness to this broken world. And it's up to us as the church to share Christ to a broken world, to love the broken world. And, and, and also, um, it also threatens how we interact with the church and how we participate with the church. You see, this is God's plan A for sharing the hope and joy of Christ to the world. What about another value that it thre threatens, I think is a big one, right? It's the Bible, it's God's word, that God's word is, is, it, is God inspired, God breathed. What about identity? And this may be for the teenager in the room, I don't know, I think adults struggle with this too, but you're believing a lie about who you are. You're believing something that somebody said online. You're believing that somebody says at your school or, or you're, you're playing the comparison game, what the world says about who you are instead of what the God of this universe says about who you are, which you are loved, you are cared for. You have a purpose in life that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that your identity is not in the things of this world, but in Christ and Christ alone. What about integrity? That you are a person of your word. Oh, here's another one. Whenever this says, this is all about me, values say, no, it's about serving others. Or, or it's a big one, marriage. That, that our worldly threats threaten the idea that our marriages are make, meant to make us happy. Well, that's not true. Our marriages are meant to make us holy. You see, God's original design for us is for us to paint a, a good picture of what the gospel of Jesus Christ looks like. And so that means we have this agape love towards one another, this unconditional love. 
and we're not pursuing the happiness. What about unity? I mean, we know in our culture we are divisive. And I want people to know what we're for rather than what we're against. You know, unity doesn't mean that we're not diverse, but it does mean that we are not divided. Uh, the, John 17, Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays specifically over his disciples and he could have prayed for anything. He could have prayed for opportunity. He could have prayed for protection. He could have prayed for anything. But you know what he prayed for? He prayed for one thing. And that one thing was oneness, that they would be one in their efforts to share the gospel, that they would be unified. Here's an idea. What if... What if Christians with different political views work together to confuse the politicians? Why? Because we are connected by something that's far greater than politics. We're, create, we're, we're connected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I look at all these things and I'm thinking, how do we respond? How do we respond to the worldly threats or threaten our, our values? Well, let's look at scripture. Let's look at Joseph's response. Let's take just a moment to look at this guy that we shouldn't be talking about right now, by the way. Did you realize that? There's no reason why we should be talking about this guy named Joseph. But he did something. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed there until the death of Herod. If we're going to experience all that God has for us, we have to take action. And here, you can write this down if you'd like. We have to respond by submitting to the will of God, and that's obedience. That's obedience. Joseph's, Joseph's whole life was probably lived in confusion. He, his wife, his, well, his fiance at the time shows up pregnant. Confusing. And then he has to make a trip to Bethlehem, which is around 80 miles. And then, and then his, his family was threatened by a king that was out to get them, get, kill his baby boy. And, but there's one thing that defined Joseph's life, faithfulness, obedience. Because Joseph understood this. He understood that God has been faithful and he fulfills his promises. And Joseph's response was obedience. His response to all of that was obedience. And because of his obedience, get this, Jesus' life would be preserved, would be preserved for one day that he would pave the way for salvation for all people. That's what, that's what Joseph's obedience did. And, and I believe Matthew, he records, out of Egypt I called. He records that for a reason because he's, he's making the connection with salvation because that out of Egypt was a prophecy that was told about in Hosea. Hosea 11 verse 1. And that, that prophecy is in reference to Israel's exodus from Egypt. And here's what I think Matthew was doing. He was saying, just as Moses delivered his people from slavery to Pharaoh, it would be Jesus who would deliver his people from the slavery of sin. That's why that's included. And I think about that obedience with, with Joseph. And, and obedience to the will of God can, can be summed up in a couple of different ways. But I think Paul writes it best. The Apostle Paul, he was writing to the church in Rome. And one of the things he was writing to the church in Rome, because, because he knew that there was threats on the church. He knew there was threats on the believers. And because he knew that, he wrote these words. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Well, what does that word conform really mean? It means identical. It means similar. Do not be similar or identical to the to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. That means from the inside out that, that we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. Then what? Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. You know, looking at Joseph's life, I really can identify three ways that he did that. The first was this, by letting go to pursue something better. I think Joseph, that's what defined his life. He let go of his own desires, his own will, and he pursued the will of his father in heaven. He said, I know this is gonna be a difficult road, but I'm gonna pursue him, even if I don't understand. Number two, seeking God when the circumstances may be difficult. You know what Joseph really could have done at the time? When Mary showed up and said that she was pregnant, I'm out. 
He could have. I mean, this is not my biological child. This is going to be too hard. This road is going to be too difficult. But what does he do in, instead? He was seeking God when the circumstances were difficult. And guess what? We're talking about him right now. Number three, giving up our wants in order to pursue God's purposes. Joseph understood something. He understood sacrifice. And what I'm not saying here is I, I, I'm not saying for you to move your family to Egypt. Well, maybe Alaska in a hut. I'm not, I'm not saying that. It would be easy to say, we're going to run away from this worldly threats. We're going to take up. If your family's in danger of their life, I would, I would recommend calling the authorities first. I don't think that necessarily is the response to these worldly threats. And you're saying, well, what then? We live in a broken world. Our, we, we look around us and our world is ridden by sin. We, we see people opposing the will of God. We see people refusing to honor God or ignore the promises of God. I'm not saying that we run away, but what I am saying is that we have to reimagine Reimagine your life centered around Jesus. A, a boy whose life would be spared would go on to teach us about the world. You know, which had another response, by the way. What would he teach us about the world and, and our place in the world? What would he go on to pray for believers? You see, the, on the eve of his crucifixion, he, had, he prayed this prayer. If you could turn to John Chapter 17, verses 14 through 19, he prays for all believers and they had threats against, against them. They, he, Jesus knew that they were gonna experience more threats. He knew that it was gonna be hard to be a follower of Christ. And he says this, I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is that not you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even though I, even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. That word sanctified means to be made holy. That word holy means to be set apart. So he's saying, I want them to be set apart. They can be in the world, but I want them to be set apart from the world. He's clear. He doesn't want his followers to be of the world. He says that he's not of the world. And he doesn't want his followers to be of the world. But, but notice that for Jesus being not of this world isn't a destination. It's the starting place. It's the starting place. It's not where things are moving toward, but what they're moving away from. And Jesus is not asking the Father. He's not saying, Father, I want you to remove the disciples from this world. No, he's praying for them as they're sent to the world. That's different. And I have to pause and say, why did Jesus want that to happen? Because he knew that this world was broken in need of a savior. He knew that this world was broken and needed somebody, church, to go take the hope and joy and love to this broken world. He knows that the world needs Jesus and he's gonna use the church as his conduit. I think we have to pause for a second and say, what's our centerpiece? What's our centerpiece in our homes and in our life and in our hearts? What's our centerpiece? Let's think about centerpieces for a second. You may have a centerpiece in your home. You walk through the front door and maybe there's a the centerpiece is a wall with a bunch of different pictures or paintings and you want that to be the focal point of your home. Or maybe it's, it's this beautiful couch that you got and you have a bunch of throw, throw pillows on it, a rug, or not a rug, but a, a quilt or something like that. And it's all on the couch. You want that to be your centerpiece or maybe you actually have a table that's a centerpiece table with something on it. My question is, as we approach 2019, What's your centerpiece? What do you want your centerpiece? What do you want to define your family? The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I love the second part of that verse. But I, this is Jesus talking. I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. 
it is because of Jesus. I think whenever we have a centerpiece of Jesus for our home, whether, I mean, this is symbolic, right? But when we walk through our homes, we have a focal point. We fix our eyes and thoughts on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. That that is our focus. And I think whenever Jesus is the centerpiece of our lives, we view these threats as a way to show Jesus to the world. And we view these values as a way to glorify and honor him. So today, we reflect on Joseph's life, of course, that he was obedient and he submitted to the will of God. And his life was used to preserve a boy's life that would grow up and provide salvation for the world. How incredible is that? But we also remember Jesus' life. A life who taught us what it means to be sent to a broken world, to be the light of the world. We need to remember not that Jesus' life was spared, that we remember that Jesus would be spared so that eventually he would give his life away freely. How incredible. We have an incredible savior. And as we close out 2018 and begin 2019, we have to ask ourselves the question, what do we want 2019 to be for me and my family? Do we want Jesus to be the centerpiece? Today, we close out with communion. And as a church family, we we're gonna remember and for the kids in the room, we, we remember, and, and I, wanna, I wanna teach you in a different way. And I want somebody to come out here and help us to remember. I don't know about you guys, but I have problems remembering things. It's been that way ever since I was a little kid. See, um, I forget was probably one of my favorite phrases growing up. <laughs> my mom would ask me, hey, Amy, did you make your bed this morning? I forgot. Or, hey, Amy, did you remember to do your homework before going to school today? Ooh, I forgot. And growing up, it hasn't gotten any better. I still forget things all the time. But luckily, they actually make tools to help you remember things. Um, one of the best ones, well, maybe not the best, but one of the oldest ones is a little piece of string. Okay? So if you're trying to remember something, you take a little piece of string and you tie it around your finger, just like so, so that when you look at it later, you can remember what you're supposed to do. The problem is, I remember tying it, but I don't remember why I tied it on my finger. So it doesn't work very well. But then they came up with these great inventions called post-its. How many of you guys know post-its? I use them all the time. They're great because you can actually write down what you're supposed to remember on the post-it. And then you can take it and you can stick it wherever you need to so you can look at it later and remember. The problem is I forget where I stick the post-it and so I lose them and I forget again. Still don't remember. And then there's these great inventions that they have nowadays called cell phones. We use them for everything. And the great thing about a cell phone nowadays is that you can actually program stuff into it and set an alarm to help you remember something later on. But then you forget to charge your phone one night and it ends up dying and you don't have your charger with you and it's dead and it will not remind you of what you need to remember. So, forgetting again. Forgetting isn't something new, though. It's been around since the beginning of time. In fact, Jesus knew that his disciples were really forgetful, too. And so on the night he was betrayed, he actually wanted them to make sure he re that they remembered what he did for them. So, as they were eating, he got a piece of bread. Kind of like these crackers that we have here. And he took it and he broke the bread. And he told his disciples, this is my body, which was broken for you. When you eat this, remember me. Then he took a cup of wine and he held it up. And he said, this is my blood, which I've shed for you. When you drink this, remember me. 
And you see, we've actually used these symbols for almost 2,000 years now, ever since he first did it at that Last Supper, and the, the symbols haven't changed. You see, when we trust Jesus and we accept him as our personal savior and he is in our hearts, we take communion so that we can remember the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. So as we take communion today, it's simple. We just remember him. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your body that was broken, your blood that was shed, and the sacrifices you have made for us. And as we take communion, we remember you and all the sacrifices that you have given. And we love you for that. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And today we transition to communion as we take as a, as a church family to remember the body that was broken, to remember the blood that was shed. But what better way to end 2018 and begin 2019 as we start another year that we want Jesus to be our centerpiece, want him to be our foundation, that we want to build our life on him. After I pray, we can go to the table. It's going to be self-serve this morning, so you take it and you dip it in. And, and, but before we go to the table, let me pray a blessing on our time. Father, we thank you. We gather here at last Sunday at 2018 to say thank you. And we remember. And we begin 2019 by saying thank you. And we remember. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.